the Torah. Baruch Ata Yehovah Eloheinu Melech Hadalem Asher Kishenu B'Mitzvatav Vitzvinu Lo Asak Pin Pere Torah. Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name and the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Amen. Remain standing as we read from the Torah portion, Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, and then from Nehemiah chapter 8, 10, and then from the Brit Kadashah, uh, Luke chapter 22, 61 and uh, 62. By now, Abram was old, advanced in years, and Jehovah had blessed Abram and, uh, Abraham in everything. Abraham said to the servant who had served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, Put your hand under my thigh, because I want you to swear by Jehovah, God of heaven and God of the earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from among the women of the Canaanites, among whom I am living, but, not, but that you will go to my homeland, to my kinsmen, to choose a wife for my son Isaac. Abraham Zeken ba Bayamin ba Yahova Berak et Abraham Bako, ba Yamer Abraham el Abdado Zekan Beito Hamoshel, ba Shpi Akba Yahova Elohai Hashamayim, ve Elohei Haaretz Asher Lo Tikach Ashia Lebni Mibnot Hakani Asher Anoki Yosheb Bikirbo Ki El Arzi ve El Molad Ti Telek Valach It Ay. Isha Lebnia Yatsak. Nehemiah chapter 8 10. Then he said to them, Go, eat rich food, drink sweet drinks. I like that part. <laughs> Send portions to those who cannot provide for themselves, for today is consecrated to our Yo Lord. Don't be sad, because the joy of Yehovah is your strength. Vayomer lechem elku, iklu mashmanim, ushtu mam tahim, vishil ho, manot lein nakon, lo ki kadosh hayom eladenu, baute tsebu ki hadva yi hi mu And Luke 22, 61 and 62, the Lord turned and looked straight at Kepha, and Kepha remembered what the Lord had said. And before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and he cried bitterly. Vayifen ha adon, vayabet el petros. Vizkor Petros et et bar ha adon, ashed de ber el ayula mor, beterem yikra hatar en gol, tehesh bi shalish pa amim, vaetse, fetros ha chutza, vae marer babeki. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and everlasting life in our midst, and blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Someone shout holiness. Amen. Have a seat. Get your uh, <coughs> Bibles out. Get your notebooks out. Settle in. Plan to stay for just a little. I command all bladders to remain still. I command all emergencies to cease. And I command for us to hear and see what God has for us today. We've been talking about the call to holiness. We are in lesson four. And I told you it's going to be quite a long lesson, probably not. I mean, not a long lesson today, but <clears throat> a long series when we talk about the um, call to holiness. And we've been using a um, couple standard scriptures, 1 Peter chapter 1, 16, that says, I am holy, therefore you be holy. And then also Romans chapter 8, 29 that tells us, <clears throat> get, go ahead and put those scriptures up, that tells us because those whom he knew in advance, he also determined in advance, would be conformed to the pattern of his son, so that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. He wants us to be conformed to him. So if we would look ourselves in the mirror, we would realize that we got a little ways to go. We're closer today than we were five years ago. Some of us have <clears throat> made giant steps. Some of us are doing little tiny steps, but we're still moving. And we're still going forward. And that's a blessing. Turn to someone and say, it's a blessing. At least you're going forward. We talked about it in lesson one. I believe that we are to arise from our slumber. And we know what slumber is. He told us, oh, sleeper, you need to arise because we are living in the day and age where we have to pay attention. And last week I talked about considering <clears throat> your ways to think 
about your life. Did anyone go home? Don't raise your hand because I don't want to be disappointed. But in your brain, and I'll pretend that every hand is raised. Did anyone go home and think about your life? I see all hands are so wonderful. What your mind can do. And because holiness is important, <coughs> we had an introduction. And we're going to spend a couple weeks and a couple more weeks just understanding what sin does. Because to understand holiness and the power of holiness is to understand the power of sin. And what I said to you in the very beginning is, is that we have not, especially in this day and age, paid attention to what sin does. We renamed it. Problem, situation, addiction, this, circumstances, situation. And sometimes they are that. <clears throat> but sometimes it is sin. And if we don't name it, and we don't name it in our own lives, which means we don't name it in our children's lives, which we don't name it in our grandchildren's lives, then we will begin to live a life of Complete sin without any instruction and direction. So we've been talking about sin, and I don't, you know, a lot of times, well, we need to talk about holiness. We are talking about holiness <clears throat> because you need to understand both sides. That's why I want to get this side out of the way. Then we all become so holy that when I preach about it, you'll be like, oh, I am there, Pastor, I am there. Number one, we said that sin does not satisfy. Does anyone have it memorized yet? Sin does not satisfy. Number two, sin leads to more sin. Number three, sin leads to worse sins. And then last week we talked about sin enslaves. That was good. Just let myself know that. And then number five was sin degrades and humiliates. And we know that Yehovah upgrades and <clears throat> doesn't humiliate. So now we're at number six, and we're going to go to number ten. So if you're, you know, you like to keep track of time and, and where I'm at. We're going to go from six to ten today, okay? And just to give you a little hint, I have about 21 of them. So, you know, a couple more weeks, and then we'll, we'll be jumping off. So number six is this. Sin steals joy. I, I don't think that we understand. We underestimate the importance of joy. There are many scriptures, and I'm going to give you a few, but if you ever did a, a study, just a word study on joy, you're going to find out why it's so important. We read from Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, and the last part of Nehemiah says, The joy of the Lord is my strength. Now, what's important to know? You need strength. And where does your strength come from? Yes, it comes from him, but it comes from the joy of him. You know, there's a difference between saying, God, I need, I need strength. And he's saying, strength will come to you when you have joy in me. So the joy of the Lord is my strength. In Psalm 1611, it talks about in his presence is fullness of joy. You make me know, <clears throat> you make me know the path of life, and your presence is unbounded joy. In your right hand, eternal delight. Come on, I think we're missing out on some joy. I think we're missing out on some joy. I mean, y'all should have been skipping and hopping when you got in here. You should have been skipping and hopping doing praise and worship. You should, you should be skipping and hopping when you're ready to go eat. You should be skipping and hopping tomorrow and then the next day and the next day. Why? Because there's something that even though life changes, there's one thing that never changes, and that is Yeshua is the Son of God. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A <coughs> happy heart or a cheerful heart. Or King James says, a merry heart is good medicine. Maybe the next time you say, I need an Advil, I need a Tylenol, I need some drugs. You might want to try some joy. Try it first. Just try it first. That's all I'm saying. How many ever tried something, didn't work, tried something else? So <laughs> why not just try the first thing that the scripture says would be a good medicine to you? Now, again, you got to be very careful because you got to try it out on yourself. Because the next time someone says, I have a headache, do you have a, a Tylenol? And you say, no, but you can have the joy. Be prepared to run. <clears throat> a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit 
dry at the bones. Or this way it says, but low spirits sap one's strength. I think we walk around with no strength. And we're trying to figure out what is wrong. And what is wrong is, listen, it's not that you work too hard. I'm not saying that you don't work hard. But I'm saying it's not that you work too hard because actually the generation before you worked a whole lot harder than we did. I just want you to know something. I mean, when I'm cold, I flip some, a switch on. When they were cold, shoe is correct. <coughs> they had heat on the lower part of their home, not the upper part of their home. When I stayed with my grandmother, there was 14 blankets placed upon me in the dead of winter. And I couldn't move. If I had to pee, too bad. I couldn't get all those 14 off me. I just had to say, oh, Lord, help me. We have it easier. Again, I know that you work hard, so don't go home mad. He says I don't work. I know you work hard. But let's just face some things. Hello? Let's just face some things. You still go to the bathroom in a warm spot, not outside looking for something. I've been to the Ukraine. I get it. There are many times in Ukraine, we went there in the wintertime when it says, I need to go to the bathroom. And I said, where is it? Outside. I said, I can wait. I have no problem. In the name of Yeshua, shut it down. <laughs> and so we have it a little bit easier. So what, what I'm trying to say is, <clears throat> is that we need to try having some joy. Put some praise music on. Put some worship music on. Uh, uh, push yourself. Uh, talk to yourself. You all talk to yourself. Talk to yourself the right way. Proverbs 18, 14 says, a person's spirit can sustain him when ill. Did you get that? A person's spirit can sustain him when they're ill. But a broken spirit, you cannot bear it. So when I look at those scriptures, Nehemiah, Psalms, Proverbs 17 and also 18, and I realize that sin was going to steal my joy, it means that I can endure almost anything when my spirit is up. But when it is down, when I'm wounded, and I allow that wound to live in me, when I'm crushed, when I'm depressed, when I'm down, the smallest thing can just bring me to my knees. The smallest thing. Because all seems lost without joy. And sin steals See, sin <clears throat> bursts the bubble of joy and breaks communion with the source of all true happiness. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. And in the fullness of Jehovah is joy. So that means when sin comes, it breaks your relationship, therefore breaks the source of your joy. Joy is the most infallible sign of the presence of God, and sin drives that presence away. Now, let me just say this. I know he's never left us nor forsaken us. So when I say that sin drives the presence away, who actually is driving the presence away? You are. <clears throat> he's so loving, so kind to us. Even when we go through all these 21 uh, uh, principles of sin, there's something you always need to keep in the back of your mind. He is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins. And he already knew where you would sin before you would even think about it. And he still chose you. But we need to understand <clears throat> the power of that sin. And I know that we have the power of the Spirit of God. But when we allow sin to re-enter, when we again become entangled, then we're going down a path that causes us to be separated. Sin steals something that all the money in the world cannot buy. Where there was fullness, there now is a gaping hole. Where there was peace, there is now turmoil. So the question is this. What fleshly pleasure is worth such great loss? And again, if we would consider our ways and think about our lives, we would decide that nothing is worth the joy of the Lord in my life. Number seven, we realize that sin steals our confidence before Jehovah. 
You know, we can just use our natural. When you were a child and you and you did something wrong, you didn't want to look in your mother or father's face. You didn't want to be around them. You didn't want them to ask you how. You know, if you did something wrong in school, wasn't that the day they asked you how it was in school? How'd you do today in school? Wasn't that the day you just thought someone told on you? And you wanted to go right to your room. You don't want to pay attention. You don't want to look at anyone. You don't want to have any conversation. I'm tired. I need to go to my room. <clears throat> Listen, you're tired. You want to go to your room because the confidence that you had to be able to come before your parents is gone because you've done something wrong. And sin steals our confidence before Jehovah. Adam and Eve lost confidence. When they sinned, what did they do? They hid themselves like a child hides from a parent. Sin steals all purity and innocence, and it makes us uneasy with people and uncomfortable with Jehovah. You know, if you've been bad, and then maybe talk about someone, gossip about someone, and then you see that person, you don't want to spend time with them. Because you all, you all just, <laughs> you just said something about them. <laughs> so you're like, hey, hi, I gotta go. Because you feel bad, right? And it makes you uncomfortable. <clears throat> you can't look at people in the eye. Your head is down. Your shoulders are sagging. You're silent. The, the boldness of your life is gone. The enthusiasm has vanished. Your spark is missing and the authority is drained. Which is why you say even to yourself, why would the devil flee from me? Because you're rehearsing about your sin and you have no confidence before Jehovah. So therefore, you don't even rebuke the devil anymore. Satan knows it, and he plays it against us, right? You know, in Acts chapter 19, 13 through 17, <clears throat> I'll just throw it up there, but we know the story. The story is about, you know, Yeshua cast out devils, Shaul cast out devils, and then we had this one guy that wanted to cast out devils just like these two casted out devils, and so he did cast out some devils, but he got this, this one devil that the devil decided, listen, I'm tired of being cast out by someone who don't have no power. And he said, Yeshua, I know. Shaul, I recognize. And you, and we know the scripture. He got beat up, right? Sometimes, because we lack our confidence, we get beat up by the enemy. And we need to get back and realize <clears throat> that if I submit to God and then I resist the devil, then the devil will flee from me. And that no matter what happens in my life and no matter what path I go down or what choices are make that are bad. And I'm not saying we, we you know, uh, when Paul said because we're under grace, does it mean that we sin? And he said, what? <clears throat> Heaven forbid. But we do have this understanding that we have an intercessor. We, we have to remember something. You did not save yourself. You can't do it. You're too evil. As cute as you are and as nice as you think you are, <clears throat> listen, any cir circumstance or situation can turn you. Well, that's just in a bad mood today. Mm-hmm. It just means bad mood did not produce it. The bad mood didn't allow it to be stationary. You understand what I'm saying? You didn't have a lock on your gate. Normally you have a lock on your gate. <clears throat> but in the, being in a bad mood or you weren't feeling well, someone let the gate ajar. And now we are seeing some stuff. And it's not pretty. So hallelujah I have some good news for you, and the good news is that we can live in such a way that makes us confident before Jehovah. We've been in, in the book of 1 John for <clears throat> 42 weeks. We're headed toward our 43rd uh, uh, week, and here are some scriptures that we have read throughout our study. 1 John 2, 28, And now children remain united with him so that when he appears we may have what? Confidence and not shrink back. So what will cause you not to shrink back and have confidence? <clears throat> you remain in him. What happens when you don't remain in him? You lack confidence. And what happens when you lack confidence? You shrink back. Just follow the procedure, people. So if you say to yourself, I feel so far away from God, then what has taken your confidence? And that's the thing you have to focus on and ask God to forgive you about. Then you have confidence. Uh, 1 John 3, dear friends, if our hearts know nothing against us, we have what? 
confident in approaching Yehovah. Look at 17, uh, chapter 4, 17. Here is how love has been brought to maturity with us. As the Messiah is, so are we in the world. This gives us confidence in the day of judgment. Will we be sinless in the day of judgment? Only by Yeshua. Listen, if you're looking for the window when you'd be perfect in him to come, you just need to stay in your room and lock your door. Because you might miss it. Any given moment, any given second, you could be not where you're supposed to be. And when the shofar blows, so we know it's not about us. When we look at 1 John chapter 5, this is the confidence we have in his presence. If we ask anything that accords with his will, he hears us. We, we just read this a couple weeks ago. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, then we know that we have what we have asked from him. Confidence. Yeshua is the key to our confidence. You are not the key to your confidence. Your perfection is not the key to your confidence. Yeshua is the key to your confidence. <coughs> your obedience is not the key. Yeshua is the key. Yeshua is the key to your confidence, having already made a way for you, being determined to keep that way wide open. He will not lose one. How many want to rename yourself one? When he left the 99 to go after the one, look at my name tag, one. One. <laughs> he will not lose one. One. Look at the back of my shirt. One. Right? I don't mind claiming it. I'm not me, I'm part of the 99. Oh, go ahead with yourself. But at any given time, the one and the 99 can exchange positions. Right? He didn't say just the one, the only one, this bad one, the only one that escaped. He says the one, the one at this time that got out, the one that this time did something wrong. And you 99, that's good. But guess what? Next week it's going to be one of you. And you better be thankful I went after this one because when it's you out of the pen, you know, Hebrews chapter 4, 14 and 16 and also Hebrews 10 <clears throat> 19 and 22, which we'll read again after this slide, says, Therefore, since we have a great Kohen, Kadal, who has passed through to the highest heavens, Yeshua, the Son of God. So let me just add, say, say this to you. We have a high priest that's passed into the highest heaven. You're still here. <laughs> right? So just know your status. You need to know someone in high places. Right? Let us hold then what? Firmly. To what we acknowledge as true. Uh, why is he telling us to hold firmly to what we know is true? Because there's someone that's trying to get it away from you. And who's trying to take it away from you? The enemy. And who else? You. Your flesh. He says, for we do not have a Kohen Kadal unable <clears throat> to understand our weaknesses, since in every respect he was tempted just as we are. And the only difference being he did not... Sin. Therefore, let us what? Approach the throne from which God gives grace. <laughs> Approach the throne from where God gives grace. Right? So that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. The whole purpose of an intercessor and that you can come before the throne of God is that you find grace and mercy at your time of need. <clears throat> right? And how many times of need do we have? Many. Many. <laughs> many in one day. Sometimes. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> so brothers, we have confidence to use the way into the holiest place. Open by what? Not by your goodness. Not by your cuteness. Not by your family. Not by your church association. Hello? Hello? How is this path open? By the blood of Yeshua. You better find the path that's, that is <clears throat> stained with his blood. 
There's no other path. There's broad ways. There's other ways. But there's only one way. When you look down, it's stained with blood. And that is the way that is open to him, to the confidence of the Father. He inaugurated it for us as a new and living way through the, the paraket or the atonement by means of his flesh. We also have a great Cohen over God's house. Therefore, let us approach the holiest place with a what? A sincere heart in the full what? Assurance that comes from, do you believe Yeshua? Is Yeshua the son of God? Then even if you sin and it starts to break your confidence, <clears throat> instead of running for the hills and the trees, instead of diverting your look and dropping your shoulders, run to the path stained with blood and ask him to forgive you and your confidence will be restored. Listen, I'd rather be confident than cowering. I'd rather be pressing forward than shrinking back. I'd rather be living clean than standing condemned. I'd rather breathe fresh air than smog. Right? I'd rather have a good report than a bad report. I'd rather choose purity instead of pollution. So don't let sin steal your confidence. <clears throat> Number one, sin does not satisfy. Number two, sin leads to more sin. Number three, sin leads to worse sins. Number four, sin enslaves. Number five, sin degrades and humiliates. Number six, sin steals your joy. Number seven, sin steals your confidence. And number eight, the wages of sin is death. You know, there is only one way in which sin is faithful. We talk about God's faithfulness, but sin is also faithful. But it's only faithful in one way. It reward is always death. Now, it won't tell you that <coughs> because sin never shares the secret uh, with you. It, what it says and and. Uh, is actually the opposite. It tells you and promise you uh, riches. You'll be rich. You'll be famous. You'll be you'll have great pleasures. You'll have fulfillment in your life. You'll have power in your life. You can come and go as you please. You can do what you want in your life. This is what your life has been brought for. This is what God really wants you to have. And in reality, it leaves the secret out. That the wages of sin. Is death. <coughs> now, along the way. Guess what we will experience? We will, even through sin, experience riches, fame, pleasures, right? I mean, go look at those people out there that are out there partying and drinking and drugging. At that moment, they're having, I mean, they're not taking the saying, I'm in the worst time of my life. I mean, they're, they're doing whatever they want to do, when they want to do it, sleeping with whoever they want to sleep with, when they want to do it. And in their view, they are having a good time. If you go and tell them you're not really having a good time, then they're going to look at you like you're crazy. You have to make them realize this is a good time for now, but sin has a secret. And the secret that sin is keeping from you is that the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Death, both natural and spiritual. So when <coughs> they had a choice to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and or the tree of life, and they chose the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they ate it. Did they die then, or did they die later? Yes. They begin to die naturally, and they died spiritually, because there's always a wage that sin offers you. See, sin brings death not 20 years from now, not 40 years from now. Death starts in the beginning. As soon as you eat the tree, as soon as you eat from the tree, death. Was it visible? Did they feel it? Did they sense it? No, they're still the same people they were, right? Other than hiding. <coughs> there was no, nothing visible that death had occurred. But as life continued, right? So sin brings death at the start. It assaults our sensi sensitivity. It trashes our conscience. It mauls our willpower and it defiles our soul. That's what sin does. And you could say, which is a 
very hard thing to say that every time we sin, something in us dies. We've been made in the image of God. God has breathed into us the Ruach HaKadosh. <coughs> and though he's with us, never leave one, never forsake one, never lose one. There's a lot between the 99 and the one and the path that you went down, a lot of things that you could have lost. Could have brought back a little lamb without a leg. Could have brought back a little lamb without seeing, right? And so at the end of the road, sin prays or pays up with death. It means separation from Yehovah. Paul simply warns us this way in Galatians chapter 6, 7 and 8. Don't delude yourselves. Let's let, let that sit there for a moment. Who's he talking to? So, church people, you can delude yourself. Oh, not me, I'm led by the Spirit. He just told you don't delude yourself. Not me, I read the Bible every day. He just told you, don't delude yourself. Because now when you're saying and making excuses that you are led by the Spirit and you read the Bible, you already have in delusion. We are just like children. Don't touch that. And what do we do? We touch it. And so you slap their hand and they cry. And you said, that is it. And you turn around and what are they doing? And you said, didn't I just tell you not to touch it? And you smack their hand again, and they cry aloud. <laughs> and you turn around, what they do? Don't delude yourself. You have to train up a child the way you should go, which means what? More than one time do you tell them what is right and what is wrong. So don't delude yourself. Read the word all you want. That's great. I want you to pray. I want you to <coughs> be led by the Spirit. I want you to come to the house. I want you to. But don't forget that you still can delude yourself. No one makes a fool of God. And here's the following. A person reaps what he sows. He's talking about the world, isn't he? Because that world, I'll tell you what, that world, it's going to, no, he's talking to you. It looks for a little while that kind of sin is bringing happiness. It looks a little while that sin brings gratification and also it looks like sin brings promotion. And you say things like this. Well, it has to be God because, the, you know, look, at, look how blessed I am. <laughs> when will we learn? When will we learn? Yehovah's very honor when we are engaging that and moving that way is being mocked. And he will not be mocked. After all, if sin is so bad, we'll say, if, if Yehovah is so strongly against it, then why does it seem like there's no consequences for it? You know, sometimes in our own lives we watch people and we see people and we scratch our head thinking, wow, I mean, they seem to be blessed. They seem to be going on. on. They seem to be everything's going fine. And, <clears throat> and we... And we look at our own lives and we're struggling and we're going through this and we're like, where's the justice in this? Why does it appear that people are getting away with such foul and fleshly acts and you're trying to be goody two shoes? Right? You're serving God, come to church, you look at your checkbook, it's zero. They're running around stealing, cheating. They, they can buy anything they want to buy. And you're like, I should have came to God later in life. But you will sow what you reap, because God will not be mocked. <clears throat> now, I decided to do something, because it is Sabbath, and we do study the Word. I'm going to read to you Psalms 37. Don't get nervous, because Psalms 37 has 40 verses. But where are you at? In church. So I want to read this to you. I want you to pay attention to it. I, and if you, if you have your Bible, open up and, and follow along with me. If not, <clears throat> and this is your Bible, then follow along with me. I won't, I won't delay it, but I do want you to understand the impact of it because Psalms 37 has been written to you, been written to me, been written to you and me who struggle with what's going on in the world and why it looks like we don't have <clears throat> God's vengeance. Look what it says. Are you ready? <clears throat> don't be upset by evildoers. Or envious of those who do wrong. For soon they will wither like grass and fade like the green of the field. Trust in Adonai and do good. Settle in the land. Feed on faithfulness. Then you will delight yourself in Adonai and he will give you your heart's desire. 
Commit your way to Adonai, trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine forth like light, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before Adonai. Wait patiently till he comes. <clears throat> Don't be upset by those whose ways succeed because of their wicked plans. Stop being angry. Put aside rage. Don't be upset. It leads to evil. For evildoers will be cut off, but those hoping in Adonai will inherit the land. Soon the wicked will be no more. You will look for his place, and he won't be there. But the meek will inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and grinds its teeth at him. But Adonai laughs at the wicked, knowing his day will come. The wicked have unsheathed their swords. They have strung their bow bows to bring down the poor and needy, to slaughter those whose way is upright. But their swords will pierce their own hearts, and their bows will be broken. Better the little that the righteous has than the wealth of all the wicked. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but Adonai upholds the righteous. Adonai knows what the wholehearted suffer, but their inheritance lasts forever. They will not be distressed when times are hard. When famine comes, they will have plenty. For the wicked will perish. Adonai's enemies will be like sheep fat, ending up in smoke, finished. The wicked borrows and doesn't repay, but the righteous is generous and gives. For those blessed by Adonai will inherit the land, but those cursed by him will be cut off. Adonai directs a person's steps. He delights in his way. He may stumble, he, he <clears throat> but he won't fall headlong, for Adonai holds him by the hand. I have been young, now I am old. Yet not once have I seen the righteous abandoned nor his descendants begging for bread. All day long he is generous and lends, and his descendants are blessed. If you turn from evil and do good, you will live safely forever. For Adonai loves justice and will not abandon his faithful. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land, live in it forever. The mouth of the righteous articulates wisdom. His tongue speaks justice. The Torah of his God is in his heart. His footsteps do not falter. The wicked keeps his eye on the righteous, seeking a chance to kill him. But Adonai will not leave him in his power or let him be condemned with ju uh, and be judged. When judged, put your hope in Adonai, keep to his way, and he will raise you up to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen a wicked man yielding <clears throat> great power, flourishing like a shade tree in its native soil. But I passed by again, and he was no longer there. I looked for him, but he could not be found. Observe the poor, pure person, consider the upright, for the peaceful person will have posterity, but transgressors will be all destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off. Adonai is the one who saves the righteous. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. Adonai helps them and rescues them, rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. What's he saying to you? Mind your business. Why are you so caught up in what's going on with the wicked? <clears throat> I got you. I'll take care of you. And it doesn't matter what you see, because at the end, when you go back to look at them, they will be gone. So why are you frustrated? Quit being frustrated. Know that the wages of sin is death, and there's an opposite reward for you. See, he has set up eternal infallible principles, and what we sow, we will reap. For the godly, it means that we will reap a harvest of life if we faint not. <clears throat> we have those in Galatians 6, 9, James 3, 18, Luke 18, 1 through 18. Just write those references down. I, I won't even take the time because it says, let us not grow weary of doing what is good. Do you know, let, me just, let me just look at Galatians first. Well, let us not grow weary of doing what is good, for if we don't give up, we will... Uh, we will in due time reap the harvest. Let us not grow weary of doing what is good. What makes us weary in doing good? Because we look at other people who are doing bad, and they seem to have more. So it makes us weary. Listen, I am tired of doing the same thing and the, and the right thing. I'm tired of doing the right thing. <clears throat> and what's he telling you? Don't be weary in doing right. Right is right. Just do it because there's a reward because you will reap what you sow. Which brings us to number nine. Yehovah will punish sinners in this world and the world to come. Listen, it is enough that Yehovah has established immutable laws of sowing and reaping so that everything we do has consequences for better or for worse. <coughs> now, we live under that principle. Right. Listen, it doesn't matter whether you were born again, love the Lord and fill the Holy Spirit. You live under the principle. For instance, and it doesn't always occur, but smoking can lead to cancer. So if you decide to smoke, take in nicotine, <coughs> uh, 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 
smoke it, whatever, it's going to lead to something. So don't be shocked when it leads to something. You sowed, you will reap. Alcoholism leads to cirrhosis of the liver. Don't be shocked. You can cry at the altar, but what he's going to say is, these are immutable laws that have been placed in life. If you sleep around, it can lead to some disease. Don't be shocked. Don't act like it shouldn't happen to you. Listen, if you are <coughs> obese, it can lead to heart disease. Hello? Don't be shocked. Listen, your, your five dozen donuts every three months is going to lead to something. We go to the altar, we ask God, God, you are the creator of my body. I ask for total healing. And he says, if you understand and acknowledge that I was the creator of your body, then why don't you eat right? So there is a natural, immutable law that's in place. You sow, you reap. <clears throat> you take an offense, it will bring your downfall. If you have unforgiveness, it will cause you to have a broken spirit. Just those things happen. God doesn't override those. Now, by his grace and mercy, he can heal us. Right? And he does. And sometimes he doesn't because the law is in effect. But there is more to sin's rotten reward than the outworking of Jehovah's passive principle because actually the principle of sowing and reaping it's just passive, which means there's no intervention. God doesn't do it. God doesn't see you smoking and gives you cancer. God doesn't see that you're drinking and gives you cirrhosis. God doesn't see that you, <coughs> you like food, so he's going to just blow up your whole body. He doesn't intervene like that. But Jehovah himself actively judges sinners. Now, this is not a refrigerator magnet. But Leviticus chapter 26, 14 through 33 it's very powerful. Are you ready? <clears throat> but if you will not listen to me and obey all these mitzvahs, if you loathe my regulations and reject my rulings, in order not to obey all my mitzvah, but cancel my covenant, then I. Now let's see what he does. For my part, will do this to you. I will bring terror upon you, wasting disease and chronic fever to dim your sight and sap your strength. You will sow your seed for nothing because your enemies will eat the crops. I will set my face against you. Your enemies will defeat you. Those who hate you will, will hound you and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. Hopefully that will wake you up. But then he goes a little further because then he says, <clears throat> if these things don't make you listen to me, then I will discipline you seven times over for your sins. I will break the pride you have in your own power. I will make your sky like iron, your soil like bronze. You will spend your strength in vain because the land will not yield its produce or the trees in the field their fruit. And if that don't help you, yes, if you go against me and don't listen to me, <clears throat> I will increase your calamity sevenfold according to your sins. I will send wild animals among you. They will rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, reduce your numbers until your roads are deserted. Refrigerator magnet. Let's continue on. Or was that it? Oh, is this it? If, <clears throat> in spite of all this, you refuse my correction and still go against me, then I too will go against you. See, up until then, it wasn't against you. It was for you. And I, yes, I will strike you seven times over for your sins. I will bring a sword against you, which will execute the vengeance of my covenant. You will be huddled inside your cities. I will send sickness among you, and you will be handed over to the power of the enemy. I will cut off your supply of bread so that ten women will bake your bread in one oven and dole out your bread by weight, and you will eat but not be satisfied. And if for all this, you still will not listen to me, but go against me. Then I will go against you furiously, and I will also chastise you seven times more for your sins. You will eat the flesh of your own sons. You will eat the flesh of your own daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your pillars for sun worship, throw your carcasses on the carcasses of your idols. I will detest you. I will lay waste to your cities and make your sanctuaries desolate so as not to smell your fragrant aromas. I will desolate the land so that your enemies living in it will be astonished by it. You, I, you... 
I will disperse among the nations, and I will draw out the sword in pursuit after you. Your land will be a desolation, and your cities a wasteland. It's a Hallmark card. You sign it, love you, Abba. Harsh? No. The child who touched something, you spanked and yelled. If that doesn't work, you time them out. If that doesn't work, in the olden times, you beat their butt. If that didn't work, you put them in the room. If that didn't work, you sold them. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We give them away. We never sell them. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Look at Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> Again, he talks about our lives and that he will remove. Again, for the sake of time, I won't read Revelation 2 and Revelation chapter 3, but there's the scripture, Revelation 2, 5, 16, 21 through 23. You all got that written? Because you need to go home and read it. And the next scripture, Revelation 3 and also 3, 15 and 16. <clears throat> See, listen, if the whole world's against us and Jehovah alone is for us, then we have nothing to fear. But if the whole world is for us and Jehovah is against us, we need to be frightened. To hear the Creator say, I am against you in Leviticus, what a nightmare. I am against you. He didn't say that in the beginning, right? See, I want, I want, I know you do. So I want to live in harmony with my father. You know, they say if, uh, if mama's upset, so you all know it, I don't know it. I want to live in harmony with my father. I want to encourage him to kindness by my dependent, obedient walk and not provoke him to wrath by my irreverent, uh, irreverent casual, or even flagrant sins. I love my Abba. I love my daddy. I never, even my natural daddy, didn't want to upset him, make him upset with me. I would bend over backwards, do whatever I had to do because I respect it, right? <clears throat> so I wanted to live in harmony. You don't want to live in a household where your mother and father are constantly against you and you're constantly against them. That's not a good household. Right? And that's the same thing with the father saying to us. I don't want to be against you. I want to be for you. And if you want me to be for you, then encourage me in my kindness. You know, there are lots of consequences to our misdeeds. You know, you steal, you're a thief, you're in prison, right? <clears throat> you run around, broken homes. You're not taking care of your body, sick bodies. But all these pale in comparison with Jehovah's holy judgment. Psalms 90, verses 11 and 12, before I get to my number 10. Who grasps the power of your anger and wrath to the degree that the fear do you should inspire? So teach us to count our days so that we will become wise. We have taken advantage of our Abba for so long. We don't understand that he gets upset and angry. But who can stand when his gavel falls? May we consider our ways. May we be wise all of our days. May we think about our lives. All right, very quickly. Number one was. Sin doesn't satisfy. Number two, sin leads to more sin. Number three, sin leads to worse sins. Number four, sin enslaves. Number five, <coughs> sin degrades and humiliates. Number six, sin steals joy. Number seven, sin steals your confidence. Number eight, the ways of sin is death. Number nine, Yehoah will punish sinners. And number ten, and I want to leave you with number ten. But it's the most horrific one that I could ever imagine. And that is sin hurts Yehovah. See, maybe the image of our angry, vengeful Yehovah doesn't mean much to you because, yes, we sit here as born again believers. 
We're excited about that. We know that he will not lose us. We know that he loves us and cares for us. We know that even as we are in discipline, that he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. <coughs> you have to realize, and I know you do, he's your Savior. He's your Lord. He's actually your best friend, right? He's your joy, he's your life, and he's your hope. And I want you to write this down because when you sin, when we sin, let's put it with me too, right? When we sin, make it personal. When I sin, I wound my Savior. I spit in his face. I make a mockery of his love. And I deny the very words of devotion and praise. My sin stings Yeshua. Question is, is he really all you need? Is he really the reason you live? As you love to sing and proclaim and worship? Is he really the one in whom your soul delights? Then why are we hurting him with our persistent sin? Ezekiel 16. Your homework is to read all of Ezekiel 16. Read it today. Read it tomorrow. Read it Monday. Read it Tuesday. Read it till we get back again on Saturday. But I want you to understand Ezekiel 16 because it's very powerful. <coughs> In Ezekiel 16, the Lord finds baby Israel. Baby Israel is abandoned in the desert. That baby actually is kicking in her own blood. And what Yehovah does is takes her in. He cares for her until she becomes a beautiful woman. And she is now ready to marry. Which means if <coughs> she was a baby, he fed her, clothed her, took care of her, was up with her, sacrificed for her. Think about it for your own life. Did not he find you in the desert? Weren't you wounded, bound? Has he not taken care of you and loved you, nursed you, brought you back? And what's shocking is in Ezekiel 16 is that when she becomes beautiful and married, she turns away from her husband prostitutes herself to other lovers, to peoples who never did anything for her at all. And look how personal Jehovah takes this. <clears throat> I bathed you in water. I washed the blood off you. I anointed you with oil clothed you with embroidered gown, gave you fine linen sandals to wear. I put l fine linen headband on your head, covered you with silk. I gave you jewelry to wear, bracelets for your hands, necklace for your neck, a ring for your nose, earrings for your ears, and a beautiful crown for your head. Thus you were decked out in gold and silver. Your clothing was of fine linen, silk, and richly embroidered cloth. You ate the finest flour, honey, and olive oil. You grew increasingly beautiful. You were fit to be queen. Your fame spread among the nations because of your beauty, because it was perfect due to my having bestowed my own splendor on you, says Adonai Elohim. This is what I did for you. In a desert, you would have been dead. I sacrificed. I gave you of myself. How did this fair maiden Israel respond? Was she grateful for the love that was shown her? No. Because here's how she responds. And the Lord tells us. But you put your trust in your own beauty. You began prostituting yourself because of your fame. Soliciting everyone passing by and accepting all comers. You took your clothes Use them to decorate with bright colors the high places you made for yourself. And there you continued prostituting yourself. Such things shouldn't happen. And in the future, they won't. You also took your beautiful jewels, jewels, jewels made of my gold and my silver, which I had given you and made for yourself male images with which you continue to prostitute yourself. 
You took your embroidered clothing and covered them. You set my olive oil and my incense in front of them. And you took my food, which I had given you, and my fine flour and olive oil and honey that I have given you to eat and set it in front of them to give a pleasant aroma. This is how it was, says Adonai Elohim. Moreover, your sons and your daughters, whom you bore me, you took and sacrificed for them to devour. Were these fornications of yours a casual matter, killing my children, handing them over and setting them apart for these idols? And all your disgusting practices and fornications, you never remembered the condition you were in when you were young? Naked? Exposed? wallowing in your own blood. So after all this wickedness of yours, woe. Woe to you, says Adonai, Elohim. This should stop us from sinning. To mock what he has given us. To not be appreciative of where we came from and how we have arrived. It caused the father heartache. We see it in the natural all the time. As the generations get older, you know, we appreciated what our parents did for us. And as we get older, that appreciation is no longer there. I mean, I just see it in people's lives. The sacrifice. We forget the sacrifice. Even your freedom. You forget the sacrifice that was paid for you to be able to sit here. So even on our Veterans Day, we just pass, it, just pass it by memorial. We don't understand. We need to take a moment and say, wow, we're not here on our own. We are here thinking that we're here on our own, but we have to look behind and see, how did it happen? Who brought us here? What did God do for you? If you read Ezekiel 16, you will feel God's pain. Because where did he find her? In a desert, in blood, and dying. And where did he find you? In your sin, doomed to hell. The wage of sin is death. And he found you. And he has worked with you. And he has supplied for you. And he has loved you when you were unlovable. And he has clothed you and he has fed you. And then we take all that he has done for us and we turn it and give it to someone else, not even remembering what he has done. Sin hurts your father. Transgression smites our Savior. And our disobedience causes him great grief. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, as I'm coming to the end, Adonai regretted that he had made humankind on the earth. Have you ever been there? I just regret, I just, I don't even know why I did this. But what caused him to say that? What's the next part? His heart was grieved. His heart was grieved. You see it, you, you show people, you give them the way and then they turn around and they don't do it or they go that way and they say it's all about them. It grieves us. It grieves him. Luke 19, 41 through 44. <clears throat> when Yeshua had came closer and could see the city, he wept over it, saying, If you only knew today what is needed for shalom, but for now it is hidden from your sight. For the days are coming upon when your enemies will set up a, a barricade around you and circle you, hem you in on every side, and dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls, leaving no stone standing one another. And all because you did not recognize your opportunity. He takes our sin quite personally. Because again, I focus on Ezekiel 16, 23. After all this wickedness of, of yours, what's he say? Woe. Woe to you. How could you? Ezekiel 23, write that down because I want you to read that too. It's graphic, intimate language. Home and read it. Because we're dealing with holiness. And to deal with holiness, we need to deal with what sin does to our Father. How it makes Him feel. Does it remove His love for us? Never. 
Will he leave us or forsake us? Never. But we cannot overlook the grief and the pain. We have to stop committing adultery against our Heavenly Father. You know, Luke gives us a unique detail about Peter's betrayal of Yeshua. We talked about it on Wednesday. I, I'm always amazed at how the Wednesday overlaps the Saturday sometimes, or the Saturday overlaps the Wednesday. And when we looked at Luke chapter 22, verses 61 through, actually we, we read um, 59 and 60, when <coughs> Yeshua said that the enemies come to take all of you and to sift you as wheat. But then he focuses on Peter and says, but I'm going to pray for you and that you're going to denounce me, but I'm going to pray for you. And when you are repented, then you're going to strengthen your brothers, right? Well, Luke gives us a very unique detail about Peter's betrayal of Yeshua. So I want us to look. Yeshua, um, Peter is at a fire, right? Someone comes up and says, are you not one of the disciples? Peter gets angry, correct? Word of God says curses at him and denies him. The Lord turned and looked straight at Kepha. Kepha remembered what the Lord had said. And before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and cried bitterly. What I want us to focus on is that sometimes when we fail, when we sin, we think like on the cross, God turns his back on Yeshua because of the sin that he carries. But Yeshua carried our sin. Right? And the righteous God could not look at the unrighteous son at that moment, but would receive the sacrifice. But Yeshua is the one who bought us. He's the one that carried your sin. So he has every right, while we're sinning, to look right at us. Most of us, if our we wanted to do something and our mother and fathers were watching, we wouldn't want to do it. That would be the thing that would stop us, right? Or someone in leadership, someone that we know could, you know. <clears throat> and I think sometimes we forget that Yeshua, who walks with us, engages with us and fellowships with us, is also right there when we sin. And he just looked at Peter. Not with condemnation. Maybe with a little. I knew you were going to do it, but I wish you wouldn't have. But that calls Peter. What's it say? To go outside and. Bitterly cry. If we would think about Yeshua. That whatever we do and whenever we do it, he is not turned away. He's watching. The very thought of that is agonizing. To go back in my own life, and if we went back in our own lives, and to think everything that I have ever done, he watched. Could it be that when we sin, rather than turn his gaze away from us, he turns and looks straight at us and still loves us? We need to answer the call of holiness. But in answering the call of holiness, we need to understand the effects of sin. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name above every name, the name of Yeshua, may we not take for granted your grace, nor your mercy, nor your love, nor your forgiveness. Let us understand as we answer the call to holiness, Father, to understand what sin does to us, to those around us, to you. Father, forgive us where we have failed you, where we have sinned against you, where you've had to look and gaze upon us in the midst of our disobedience. We humbly we sincerely ask you, change our heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change our heart, O oh God. May I be like you. I thank you that you do not condemn us. 
Thank you that you cover us. But let us not take your love for granted. As we stand before him with uplifted hands, let's just worship him. Maybe you just need to ask him, Father, forgive me. Maybe you know some exact things. Maybe you don't. Maybe you just need to say, Father, I know I failed you so many times. But I want to answer the call to holiness. And I know that you will help me, and I know that you will walk with me. But today I want to lift my hands to worship you. That when you gaze upon me, you gaze upon a man and a woman that's going to worship you because you've made us free, saved us, redeemed us. We love you. Let's lift our hands. Worship as Pastor Kenny leads us. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. And I want to say I love you. I need you Cause you give yourself away Father forgive me And cleanse me When I turn and walk away Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. true. Change my heart, oh.
good. Father, we come before you in the presence of Yeshua, thanking you and praising you for all that you've done. We ask, God, that you will watch over these children, Father, and Lord, you will empower them, anoint them, keep them. Father, Lord, that they will walk in your ways. Father, follow your direction. Father, understand how much you love them. And they, Father, will commit their lives to you totally and completely throughout the days of their lives. Father, Lord, as they stand before you as a, either a Rachel, Rebecca, Sarah, Leah, or Ephraim, Manasseh, or Joseph, or Peter, or Esther, Father, in their imperfections, still, Father, use them with such clarity and understanding. We ask that your anointing be upon them, rest upon them. We give you praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Lift up your hands to receive the priestly blessing this morning or this afternoon now. exist know before you're presenting gifts and will guard you with a hedge of protection and Yehovah he who exists will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you bringing order and he will provide you with love sustenance and friendship and Yehovah he who exists will lift up wholeness of being and look upon you he will set in place all you need to be whole and complete may Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions may Yehovah hear from heaven quickly answer all our requests save us in the day of adversity in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty, and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. See you all.